Hello to you. Welcome to The Reality Show once again. So good to be with you sharing the story of a life touched and changed by the reality of Jesus. The Bible says these things we face in the world are but a shadow. The reality of real life can be found in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Well, I'm joined today in the studio by my guest, Noel Robinson, and it's really good to have Noel with us. Noel is a singer, songwriter, producer. He's a, a recording artist. He's a worship leader, and he's done amazing work around the world. Noel has uh, started playing guitar at the tender age of just six. God eventually called him into the ministry of a worship leader. So today we're going to be talking about creating the reality of heaven here on earth with Noel Robinson. Noel, thank you so much for joining oh, us. Dudley, it's so great to be here. You know, um, always, always, you know, I've been following you and seeing what you're doing, so I'm really excited. It's a real honour to be here with you today. Thank you. It's really an honour to have you. Uh, Noel, you've done some amazing work. You're a singer, songwriter, all that I've mentioned. I uh, started learning to play guitar at an early age. You know, Jesus is Lord and Saviour. How did you come to your faith? You know, I came, I came to faith, um, um, you know, I, I was born into a Christian family. Um, so, you know, um, I picked up the guitar when my mum died. So, um, you know, as we came, the family came from Jamaica, um, the Windrush, and you might have heard that word. So we, they came into this country and obviously began to have church in, in community here. So um, um, I was born into that community. Um, so I've always been um, involved in the life of the church and got involved very early on with the life of the music in the church. But there was one particular moment where I, I would say, um, that I went, yeah, I, I, I want to be that. And that's when I was about eight and I got baptised very early. I knew there and then that I, I wanted to love Jesus forever. And um, so I remember being baptised around eight, eight or nine. And, um, and that was my real uh, commitment to God, which, which I've kept, you know, had many ups and downs. I'm sure we'll share some of that today. But, um, but um, that's where it really started for me. And, um, you know, eight or nine, being baptized. Mm -hmm. At a young age, I came to the Lord one year, well, nine. I was nine mm -hmm. when I came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And like most folk, I had a little slump in the middle when I hit my yeah. teens. Did that happen to you? Yeah. yeah. You know, the Bible talks about training a child in a way it should go so when it's old, it doesn't depart. Um, because there's certain truths uh, about that. Even psychologists will tell you that a lot of stuff happens when you're younger that impacts you when you're older. Um, so why not let a good thing happen? So growing up in that community, I was very much protected uh, from a lot of things that were happening around uh, during those years. A lot of racism was going on and we were protected from that because our parents, you know, we were at home, school and at church. Those are the three places that we attended. So yeah, as I got to my teenage years, you know, I, 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 I felt that um, I wanted to experience some more things, you know, in different things in life. And I think that I can't really say that I kind of fell out of church because because of what I was doing and to actually play music every week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I was the church music director by um, early teens. Mm. Um, so, you know, you can see that I was very much still involved. Um, my faith may have wavered a little bit because it became the norm. Uh, but then, you know, I know that God always knows how to bring us back into that place. And I most certainly had an encounter in my, my late teens that really showed me that God was real. I wasn't just serving the God that my parents introduced me to and that I received, but I was serving somebody who knew me. And I, you know, I began to really know him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think there was that, that moment in my late teens where I went, well, yeah, this is, this is so true. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I need to go all out to love God, you mm. know, and, and be a, a Christian in, in, in all the ways that you need to be. Absolutely. You know, I, I told this to my kids when they hit their teens, I said, you have to find your own faith. You mm. can't build your faith in your mom or your dad's faith or your pastor's faith or the mm. elder in the church. Yeah. You've got to find your own faith mm. and walk with Jesus. So there was a time, a moment in your life when the Lord said to you, hey, no, this is your life. Mm. Like it or leave it. And, and, <laughs> and I think even that word faith, I mean, I know that the English language is quite, interesting because when we talk about um, what is your faith you know or you know what is your belief or, or you know walking walking in your faith you know and I and I and I I, I think that growing up you know um, 16 17 did Bible college you know our, our church had its own Bible college um, I begot, I began to know more about God in the word mm. and 
and it's it's the thing that really began began to speak to me because here I was reading the word of God um, and it was like reading the biography of someone you know <laughs> yeah and and you're finding out more about him yeah, yeah. you know because um, I always say the biographies are quite interesting you can write a biography about somebody from stats collected from somewhere else and you've written a book about them and then you can write a book uh, through someone telling you they were with them and then you can write a book because you actually know um, so there was that whole thing about faith for me was yeah I've got faith but was was I able to walk that out in the experiences of life as I was growing up as a teenager mm -hmm being challenged by all the things that were happening around um, around me, yeah. And, and I think that I, I really held on to what I had learned, mm, even if I didn't fully understand yeah. all of it. Yeah. Well, I believe God watches over his word, the scripture says. Yes. His word is in your heart. You just mentioned it, reading the word of God, and God watches over his word and his plan for your life. Mm -hmm. And God's plan was to use you in music, you started learning guitar at the tender age of six. I remember uh, going to music lessons when I was a youngster and I, I, my, my piano teacher's name was Mrs. Wasserman. <laughs> Lovely German lady. She used to yeah. grab me on the cheek and say, oh, he's so cute, he's so cute. <laughs> and I hated every minute of oh, it. No. <laughs> no, yeah. You stuck it out. So yeah. tell us what happened. I think, I think one of the things that happened when I started to play, um, it, it was um, very much a, um, my dad played guitar. And it's only maybe about four years ago I found out that, because there's a question that I asked all the time, why was there a piano in our house? <laughs> and my dad didn't play piano. I, 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 it's too big to be an ornament, you know? And I, re, I, I found out that my mum, because she died when I was five, she was the piano player. In actual fact, she was the music director for the church. She was the key music person. And my dad was the one that accompanied her. So um, from that point of view, when it came to uh, the whole music thing, I began playing um, because I wanted to be like my dad. There were some significant moments that I remember. I remember dad coming in from work and I've got a younger sister, but she was too young for him to look after her for, as a female. So my aunt looked after her. And um, I remember coming from school and dad coming from work and he'd pick up his guitar and he'd start singing hymns. He'd start singing these songs, you know, I surrender all. I surrender, you know, you know, and he starts singing these, these amazing hymns. When I survey the wondrous call, and, and and I'd be like sitting there watching my dad, and he was my hero, and uh, wanting to play like him. So when he put the guitar in my hands and he goes, "This is how the first chords, G, C, D, and E," um, and he showed me an E minor. That was it. I I I quickly run with that, but it actually built up a, a real insatiable. Um, appetite for music and things musical. So by the time I was seven, I was already into well-known guitarists of the day. Uh, we're talking about um, Gary Moore, uh, Eric Clapton. I I I'd been listening to all these rock guitars, you know. Uh, just to say that I grew up on country because my dad loved country music. And so here I'm listening to this different sound uh, because of the guys around me. And there was this rock pop sound, you know, Santana, like I said, Gary Moore, um, and all these amazing guitarists. Um, and I just grew into that sound um, because there was a man at the bottom of my road that used to play those records and he played guitar. Um, so I ended up just really loving music and it, and it became my go-to. Um, in one way, it was, it was really, really powerful to have an instrument that you can express yourself on. Um, on the other hand, it, it became, um, it became the thing that I went to, um, and, and it's the thing that made me happy, um, which in some ways w was the wrong way of doing it. But here I was, young man, trying to find myself. Music was a thing, and I just began playing and loving music. Still do, but the perspective is, is, is different now, you know, mm -hmm. uh, on how we do it. So that's really my, my journey in music. And then obviously I went on to do classical guitar. So by the time I was nine, 12, I'd been doing, you know, classical Royal School, College of Music uh, grades. And I played double bass in an orchestra throughout my teens. <laughs> and um, one day my, my guitar teacher was very, very ill. Um, uh, it was gonna be out for a whole, you know, term. And I ended up going to Goldsmiths and studying jazz. Uh, their school allowed me a day off or afternoon off to go and do jazz. So 
from an early age, I had been learning the guitar, but actually applying that to local church. So whenever I learned, I thought, well, there's another way to sing a song. Let's play these chords. Let's do something different. So always developing my skills. And the church became the great place to be able to do that. Mm. That's powerful, you know. Powerful stuff. But you didn't only play for the church. I believe that you did some session work for yeah. some well-known artists like Gloria Gaynor and Denise Williams. Yeah. Tell us about that. Um, well, um, as, I, as, I, um, as I began to um, express my guitar playing, um, a lot of people thought that was really good. And, I, and um, you know, a lot of the musicians around me at that time um, they had the incredible opportunity to play for lots of pop stars, and I had that as well. So I ended up um, being, a road, being on the road with Gloria Gaynor. I was a music director for some years um, and played for Denise Williams. Wow. Uh, there's a whole load of artists as well. The names would go on and on that are really well known. But, um, and I think that's because I was, the church was the perfect training ground for a musician like me, you know, uh, willing to express yeah. and and do that. So um, I, I managed to do some of that before, um, you know, really I felt the call of God. Yeah, yeah. Um, that really did, you have, did you have an input into their lives from a Christian perspective? Yeah, totally. Um, Gloria Gaynor is an amazing believer. Um, you know, we'd have these conversations, you know, she'd sing with, I will survive. And then she'll go, um, or, or I talk about, she talks about the song and then she goes, there's another song called I Will Survive, it's about I Will Survive too, and I'm gonna to tell you how I survived. And she tells a story of meeting Jesus and turning her life, surrendering her life to Jesus. Fantastic. And it's always an amazing, um, amazing song that explains this I Will Survive, you know, uh, which is very much me song, you know, but she goes, I really survived because of Jesus. Fantastic, wonderful. Well, you're listening and watching The Reality Show with me, Dudley Anderson, today. And it's really my pleasure to have with me in the studio, live in the studio with me, Noel Robinson. We've been talking a little bit about his life and his work. Came to know Jesus at an early age, baptized at the tender age of eight, learning to play guitar at the age six, getting into music and uh, his dad being his big hero. And ended up uh, doing some secular work for some secular artists, amazing stuff, but getting into worship and worship leading. Noel, it's wonderful to have you with us today Thank you. on The Reality Show. Tell us a little about this uh, worship leading. You, you, you started a, a ministry, an organization called the, um, uh, the Kingdom Worship Movement. Am yeah. I correct? Yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you how that really started is that um, like the, I explained to the church that I belonged to, and it was a black majority church. So most of the people there were black from the Caribbean. And um, that's all I ever really knew about church. And, and one day I was asked to do a, um, a, to play for a, a really world famous artist, and I had to make a decision. And uh, long and short, the decision ended up with me saying no, because God really spoke to me and said, I called you for the house. Um, and I was like, well, but I'm already in the house. And he goes, but I've called you to serve the house, which was a real significant call in my life. Um, and, and, and what happened after that was, um, I was playing for um, a Christian artist called Tremaine Hawkins. Um, the name might be familiar, might not be, but if you've ever heard the 1970 or 1969 version of Oh Happy Day, she's the voice on it. So she came to England to do a concert and I ended up playing guitar for her. And um, I met a, 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 an A&R man there who said, hey man, you're, I didn't know you were from England because band from America. And she just said, hey, this is one of your own. And he goes, man, you're really good. And he, and he said, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk with you. So a few days later, we contacted me and he said, look, there's an artist that's going to be doing a tour of the UK. And would you like to join it? Christian artist. And I was like going, who is he? And, and they said, Graham Kendrick. And I was like, um, Graham who? I'd never heard of him before. Uh, never, you know, we sang his songs in church, but I'd never known who he was. You know, I always thought that anything, any song that we sang came from America. Um, apart from the little ones that I wrote. Um, so it was amazing meeting Graham. And uh, I spent eight years with his band playing guitar. And, and, and God really began to speak to me about, you know, sometimes God puts you in a specific place because he wants to show you your future. Mm -hmm. He wants to show you uh, where you need to go. I'm a very visual guy. So if he hadn't shown me, I'd have tried to make up my own thing, um, which I was doing practically. 
but it began to show me the people that I would serve. And through Graham, and I mean, his mentorship was very, very powerful in my life. And um, I ended up playing for Graham for many years. Then I ended up playing for Ron Canoli. I became Ron Canoli's music director. Um, so this music gifting actually took me right close up to these worship leaders. And all the time God was speaking to me and he was saying, what you see, I'm going to, I'm going to be putting you there. So it meant a lot of preparation, um, you know, studying and, and just really making sure that I was in a place where I could serve what God was calling me to. The irony of it is that I'm um, being called a worship leader because in my own church that, that definition didn't exist. That even that title didn't exist. So here I was going, I'm a worship leader, everybody go, what's that? <laughs> I'm like, it's that what Graham does. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, um, but it's more than singing songs. It's actually I'm here to help the body um, walk in the presence of God, to encourage people to do that. So um, that's how the worship leading started. And I started writing my own songs and started singing them because nobody else would. So it, it got to that place where people were saying, hey, no, would you come, that song that you wrote and that song you recorded, can you come to our church and sing? I'm going, yeah, okay, fine, I'll just show up and sing it. And everybody's, and I was like, wow, this is really cool. So in some ways, uh, the worship leading is the call of God in my life, um, where I followed and was obedient to what God wanted me to do. And I wasn't obedient to the gifting, the gifting didn't lead me. And that's, that's where I've kept my life. You know, I've, I've always followed the call of God rather than the ability that I have. Um, which opens doors, but you know, um, some doors you don't go through, but when you walk in the call of God, God always works it out for you. So that's, that's, my, that's my heart behind what I do. So we, we're creating through worship. I believe that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the only thing that we'll do for eternity is worship God. We're not gonna be preaching the gospel. We're not gonna be healing the sick. We're not gonna be taking care of the widows and the orphans, yeah. but we're gonna be praising and worshiping God forever mm. and ever and ever. So Noel, how here on earth, how does worship create the reality of heaven in the reality of earth? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things is that um, there, are some, there are some secrets in the Bible that, that, that God gives us um, as believers. You know, um, one of the great secrets is Rome, um, uh, Psalms 8. You know, Psalms 8 is a very powerful um, scripture and it talks about, in King James, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings I've ordained. And there's a word called praise and, uh, or strength, um, it's, it's defined as. And, um, and it says why. And, and I began to look at that scripture and I began to realize that uh, many believers don't understand the weapon that God's given them, okay? There's two weapons that God's given you and they're both intrinsically, I think, faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God and it's impossible to worship without faith because you've got to first believe that he is and who he says he is uh, before you can actually enter the realm of faith. So this scripture, um, as I begin to break it down, you know, out of the mouth of those sons and daughters who walk with God, um, what God does is that he's ordained, he's given you a natural ability with a supernatural function mm -hmm. that as you begin to praise, he silences the avenger. So it means that your praise becomes a defense. Your worship becomes a defense against the enemy. And so when I talk about the atmosphere and talk about worship, I talk about the more you worship, the more that you, you, and worship really is humanity's response to the revelation of who Jesus is. The more you respond to the revelation of Jesus in the word and not just through singing, and the more you speak the word, actually you begin to build a defense. His word is a shield. And I actually believe that the power of worship in its ability to change atmosphere, when it's put together with music, whoa, it actually creates something incredible. The Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people. It means that he manifests himself in the praise of his people. So as we begin to lift up in the life of Jonah, Jonah's in the belly of a big fish, right? He's, he's surrounded by darkness because there's no light switches in a fish. It's a big fish because he's in it, mm -hmm. right? And lots of other stuff. It probably smells. Yeah. Life sometimes does all these kind of things to us. But the Bible says that what he does, he, 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 does, he remembers. He remembers what he's been taught. And he goes, I will offer up thanksgiving. 
And when we begin to offer up praise and thanksgiving in the midst of it, something happens that God is enlarged in it. And oftentimes we are pushed out into safe ground. So this is the power of praise. This is where heaven's reality impacts and supersedes earthly reality. It's the supernatural combustion, I call it, wow. where faith, faith and humanity meet and it calls on the power of God. Yes. And I believe that that's what, how we live our lives in the earth. We live, we live normal lives in a supernatural way because we have access to the supernatural. Fantastic. And that supernatural is manifest in worship. The glory of God is manifest when Absolutely. we worship God. As you said, you know, um, it's comely. The scripture says it's comely. It's good looking. Yes. Handsome for the upright to worship God. And we worship God in the beauty of his holiness. Yes. So when we are actually worshiping God, we're ushering in the holiness of the sovereign God, the creator of the universe, the one who saved us from our sins yeah. and redeemed us and manifests his glory in his presence. We are creating, uh, as you've well put, the atmosphere, the yeah. very nature of the presence of God and the glory of God yes. when we're worshiping him in spirit and in truth. truth yeah. Would you say worshiping God in truth, you've got to do it from a, from a sincere heart, yes? Yeah, there, there, is, there is, truth can be put in both ways in that we're worshiping God from a, a, a sincere, sincere place, a place of nakedness, a place of God, you know, man, you know everything. But we're also worshiping from the truth that he is. And that truth doesn't waver. It means this, that there are days when you don't feel like worshiping, that doesn't change the truth of who he is. There are days when you feel down, doesn't change the truth. There are days when you feel sick. There are days when you enter seasons of your life that are very hard, but his truth doesn't change. The truth of who he is, he is still Lord and Master. And when we recognize that, it's that, it's that posture. You know, most people think that worship is singing. No, singing is an expression of your faith in God and the, when you sing what you do is that you are echoing you're echoing the word of God you're echoing your faith in into your surroundings so I believe that faith cometh by hearing by hearing the word sometimes we have got to sing to ourselves we've got to sing God you are high and lifted up we've got to sing about the greatness of God even though we may be walking through David puts it like this even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah. Guess what? Yeah. I, don't, I don't stay there. I don't stop in the valley of the shadow of death and build melancholy and lamentation around me. But you know, in my melancholy, in my lamentation, in my sickness, in my sadness, guess what? There's the hope of Christ because David goes, though I walk through that valley, mm. he's there with me in the midst yeah. of the valley. In the valley, in the, in the, in the belly. Of the in the belly. No, it's been fantastic speaking oh, with pleasure. you. We're going to take a little break to listen to a song. You are unrivaled. Quickly, just for a second or two, tell us about that song. That song really is about reminding us that we should only worship God. We should have no idols. You know, some of the things that we have in our lives, they sometimes seem more important than who God is. But the song just reminds us to have no idols uh, but God. And I actually, uh, it was an encouragement to the body of Christ that we can get clever with all the things that we do, but let's put God in his rightful place as Lord of all.
You're unraveled, and that, of course, the great music of Noel Robinson, who's been with us in the studio today on the reality show, sharing his life with us. Noel, it's been fantastic being it's with you. Pleasure. You know, we've been talking about worshiping God. It reminds me of uh, the story that we read in the Bible in John chapter 4, and it's verse 23. When uh, Jesus is talking to a lady in Samaria, they're traveling from, uh, from Galilee down to Jerusalem and Judea, and they pass through Samaria. Now, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get on very well, but they stop at a well, and this well was known as Jacob's Well. That's where the Samaritans worshipped God. And it's interesting that Jesus sends his friends down to the town to buy food, and he stops for this lady. First of all, that's very unusual because, A, she's a Samaritan. The Jews didn't talk to Samaritans. B, she's a lady, and a Jewish man wouldn't stand talking to a lady on his own. But nevertheless, he does. And they start talking about worship, and she says to Jesus, you Jews worship in Jerusalem, in the temple. We worship on this mountain. Jesus turns to her and she says, he says to her, Lady, the time is coming where you'll no longer worship God on a te in a temple or on a mountain, but you will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's a true place of worship. Not a cathedral, not a chapel, but your heart in spirit and in truth, as we've discussed today on The Reality Show. Noel, it's been fantastic being with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining us on The Reality Show today, talking about love, touch and change by the reality of Jesus. Changed lives, changed lives, and I hope our story has changed your life. Join me again next time, same place, same time, when we'll be touching on the reality of Jesus. God bless.